We're starting a new topic again today. The topic is preparing to rest. And this is going to start from some things I said in the previous lesson, but it's going to go in a different direction or a little different direction anyway. And we'll see what it means to be prepared for rest or preparing for rest and what the Bible says about that. And uh, lots of other things associated with that too. So one thing that, that I pointed out in that lesson last week was um, the, the differences or the similarities, I guess, between the weekly Sabbath, the Shemitah and the Jubilee. And we were talking about those and the seven year period and the, and the seven, seven, 49 uh, year period. And one thing that I mentioned in there, just as an off uh, unrelated uh, topic was that God provided for each group of people for those Sabbaths so th that they would have what they needed for those Sabbaths. And so what he provided for them. For the weekly Sabbath, you remember at that time, uh, they were getting manna, and then the manna would arrive on, the, on every day, but they would get twice as much on the day before the Sabbath, and they would have none on the Sabbath, so they were provided for that. The same thing happened with the Shemitah. When they had uh, stopped using the land, or they were supposed to have stopped using the land for a year, God gave them a bountiful crop before that. And for the Jubilee, where there would have been two years where the land wasn't to have been used, or harvested, or, or crops grown, or anything like that, um, God provided super extra, or was going to provide super extra. He had promised to do that. They never took him up on that offer, so it never happened. But, but that's what God was going to do. He was going to provide extra for them so that they would be able to do these things. And there's something to understand from that, is that, especially with the weekly Sabbath, um, God provided them with manna. He didn't provide them with MREs. MRE is a military uh, term. It means meal ready to eat. So he, he didn't provide them with food that was already set up and ready to eat. He didn't, uh, the food just didn't show up in their tents at sunset. Uh, and uh, it wasn't like that. They, they, there wasn't baked manna sitting there or manna alfredo or chicken fried manna or whatever they might have done with the manna. It, it didn't come to them already prepared and ready to eat. They still needed to go out and to collect it and to prepare it. And, and in doing that, God um, was teaching them something. Um, he wasn't just making them work for no reason. He was giving them uh, uh, something that they needed to learn. They needed to learn that they needed, needed to prepare for rest. And so that there were things that they would have to do throughout their lives, even after the manna stopped coming, that they were going to have to continue doing this, making these preparations for, for rest. God was going to continue to provide for them when they got into the promised land, but they still had to do the work to do the preparations so that they would be able to rest on the Sabbath. So that brings up the name preparation day. And, and in, in the Old Testament, we don't see any day that was ever called preparation day, but we do see that in the New Testament. Um, it, it is just um, not there in the Old Testament. It seems to be a term that came into use sometime in there, but it's really just a, a term to describe a principle that had always been in place. And, and we'll talk about that some more. But the, in the New Testament, we definitely see references to that. They had given that day, the day before the Sabbath, a name, and they called it Preparation Day. And so there are verses where we see that. In Mark 15, 42, we see, and when it was the day of preparation, which is before the Sabbath. Okay, so that's definitely making it clear there. Um, Luke 23, 54 says, it was Preparation Day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. Now, these are all talking about times right around Jesus' death, but that's not really relevant here. What's relevant is that they had a day that they recognized and even had given the name Preparation Day to. So in John 19.31, we see the same thing. It says, now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. So um, by that time in the New Testament, they were calling that day before the Sabbath Preparation Day, and they understood that that was the day when you prepared four things uh, to be ready for the Sabbath. And um, so at that time, they had different ways of referring to that day. They would sometimes call it the sixth day, and that was kind of their normal way of, of naming their days. They didn't have names like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They had first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, and then Sabbath. And, and so sometimes they just called it the sixth day. And, and uh, we see that in the Bible. Uh, but they also called it just the day before Sabbath sometimes. But they also had that, that new name that we don't see in the Old Testament. They would sometimes call it the day of preparation or just preparation day. So they had recognized that, that there was a day that was special, that they were to make sure that they had everything ready for the Sabbath so that they would be able to rest. 
And the idea, though, for preparation day begins in the Sabbath, in the Old Testament, um, when with those Sabbath keeping exercises that God gave to the Israelites as they came out of Egypt. And so what God had done there is he had set aside two days as special. We often only think of him setting up the Sabbath the, as being a special day, but he set up that sixth day as being a special day too. On the Sabbath, which was the day of rest, there was going to be no manna uh, at all. So they weren't going to be able to go out and collect any or do anything like that. It was necessary for them to be um, doing everything in advance. And um, But on the sixth day, God did something different too. The sixth day was different from the other days. And that was the day when they received double manna. And, and that not just that, but the manna that they got that day would last for two days. The, the manna that they got on any other day would only last for one day. And so the sixth day was again a different day, and this sixth day was there for them to prepare so that they would be able to rest on the Sabbath. In Exodus 16.5 talks about that. It says, on the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So we see that idea of, of preparation being a part of what is necessary to do to have the rest that you want on the Sabbath. And, and so preparation was that day when they got everything ready. They took care of preparing meals. Now, in their situation, it was a little different. They didn't have nine to five jobs that they had to go to like we do. Um, they were traveling around like nomads in the wilderness. Uh, but nonetheless, they had things that they had to do in their lives, uh, work that they had to do. They had animals to take care of or tents to take care of, manage all those sorts of things that life involves. There's always work that needs to be done. And so those things were the things that they needed to have done on preparation day so that they would be able to rest on the Sabbath day. And so the preparation day and the Sabbath together have a bigger meaning than just that. Um, we often think of it as just a weekly thing, but it's more than that. It's a pattern for the, for the future. And so in this life, we prepare ourselves to enter into God's rest. So all of this living that we do is, is meant to give us that opportunity to prepare ourselves to enter into God's rest. And we saw that reference in Hebrews when we were doing the Hebrew study. So, um, so it's, it's a bigger idea. It's about our whole lives and our future it is uh, this preparation day and this Sabbath idea. And so another thing that we see there, though, is that God's rest informs us about our weekly rest and, and what our weekly rest should be. So the things that we wouldn't do or wouldn't need to do when we are in God's rest are the things that we shouldn't do in our weekly rest. And, and we don't clearly understand, of course, that future rest. Um, we have just kind of glimpses of it from what's said in the scripture. And, and so it's not often clear exactly what we should do on a weekly rest. And, and the Sabbath laws are like that. They, they give us kind of a bunch of don'ts. Don't do this. Don't do work. Well, what exactly is work? Well, it's not really clear sometimes what exactly is counted as work. Um, so we, we see a bunch of don'ts like that. Uh, and so because of that, uh, it always talks about don'ts. It doesn't ever say what we should do. And, and so that isn't always clear to us. And preparation day helps us also to understand what we should do. And what we should do is we should have everything prepared so that we can rest. We should prepare ourselves to rest on the Sabbath. And that's in the same way that we are now preparing ourselves to enter into God's rest. So there's a parallel there. So now, for, not everybody came from NHU, I understand that. Um, and we may be talking about things that happen at NHU sometimes that, that is too much for people. But there are so many good examples of bad things that we can pull from there. And I'm going to do a bit of that today. Um, but the pastor there uh, was problematic for us, and that's why we split off from that group. Um, and uh, part of his problem was that he didn't understand the Sabbath. And that was partly because he didn't understand Preparation Day. And I'm going to show you how that works and, and how we could have understood better. But I don't think he really under, wanted to understand the Sabbath. Uh, he always saw it as being in his way, always stopping him from doing what he wanted to do. Always people saying, well, this is the Sabbath. You shouldn't be doing that. Well, he wanted to do that anyway. And, and so um, that was a problem for him. And, and uh, he also saw it as being irrelevant to our time. He had decided that the Sabbath just doesn't fit into our modern lives and, and therefore it isn't relevant to us anymore. But that's not good thinking at all. Um, in fact, that's really big city thinking. Um, it, you can say that um, our lives aren't like their lives. Well, that's true for city people. That's not true for rural people and, and people in other countries. Those people have lives that are very much more similar to the lives that the Israelites lived at that time. 
So it's not like the world has somehow changed. Um, but he had a lot of trouble with one particular idea, and he brought it up in a bunch of messages uh, when we were there. And I wasn't there all that long. Um, and, and that idea, or that problematic idea, uh, comes in from Exodus 35, 2 and 3, which says, For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day shall be your holy day, a day of Sabbath rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it is to be put to death. Now here's where he has the problem. Do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. And so that verse was, was a real problem for, for him, and he mentioned it, as I said, in, in sermons. But I want to point out one thing that it says there, whoever does any work on it is to be put to death. And so uh, we, we've talked about this before, is that God was impressing on the people that this is really important. And all of the people had been told uh, what they shouldn't do. They shouldn't work on, on the Sabbath, and, and they knew that. And so as a community, everybody in the community knew that. So if anyone was working on the Sabbath, they were doing it intentionally because they knew what was right, they knew what was wrong, and they were doing it intentionally. And so God said, anybody who's doing it is doing it intentionally, they should be put to death. And, and, but that's just kind of a sideline. I'm going to focus on the green highlighted area. And that's the idea of do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. And so this comes down to um, a question that a lot of people have struggled with is how to apply the Sabbath to our time. Some things, are certain, certainly, as I said, in, in the lives of city dwellers who have electrical power and other things like that, life is very much different from the way it was back then. Um, but that isn't true across the world. And, and so people have always struggled some, with certain aspects of applying the Sabbath to our time. And that's really the, the story here. And, and Israel, Pastor Israel, was certainly no different that way. Um, verse 3 is, is given immediately after that Sabbath commandment to be an example of work that should not be done. So the verse 2 says, uh, don't do any work on that day. And verse 3 says, don't, don't light any fires in your dwellings on the Sabbath day. And so um, to his way of thinking, and he's not the only one, as I said, um, there are many Jews who think along this lines too. And, and it should be understood that just because you're a Jew doesn't mean you understand the Sabbath correctly. Um, in Jesus' time, we saw that he was constantly having to correct them on their understandings of the Sabbath. And um, they had it wrong then, and, and they have some parts of it wrong now. So, but in any case, to his way of thinking, and theirs as well, um, fire was the source of heat and light in the buildings at that time. So those, those people, that was their source of both heating and light in their buildings. And, and therefore, if you try to apply it to our time, that should mean that you would not turn on the lights in our homes or you wouldn't turn on the heat in your homes on the Sabbath. And, and so um, you, it would be wrong to turn on the light switch. And, and there are Jewish communities who do that. They turn on the lights that they're going to need on the Sabbath before the Sabbath, and they don't turn them off and they don't turn them on. And, and we'll talk about if that's right or wrong here in a moment. So, but it also you wouldn't turn on the heat because that would be the same thing as uh, turning on a fire. And, and so because of these things being um, not so relevant to our days, we don't have fire in our homes for heat and light. Uh, if we have fire, it's more for just enjoyment. And, um, but um, so Pastor Israel struggled with that whole idea. He didn't care for the Sabbath much anyway. And, and so he ridiculed the Sabbath about this. And he saw, because of this, it's obviously not relevant to the age of electrical heating and electric, electricity at all. It doesn't uh, belong in our time. And, and that's because he's misunderstanding something about things and the Sabbath, and particularly about the, the preparation for a Sabbath. And, and so preparation day shows us how to handle that. Uh, God isn't saying by that commandment that I want people to freeze in the dark on the Sabbath. And it gets cold in Israel in the, in the winter. Um, there's no doubt about that. And even then, we, we see there was a time when um, Peter was um, warming himself by a fire at night because it was getting cold. And, and that was a common thing. Uh, they, they had fires for heat in many places. So it isn't God's intent that we should freeze in the dark on the Sabbath. Um, but the, so we need to understand what that verse is really about. And when we look at the context of that, it's talking about don't do any work. And then it says, don't start a fire on the Sabbath. And so we can take, put those together and get a better understanding of that. What God means by that is, do not do the work to start a fire on the Sabbath. And starting a fire was work. Um, if you're starting from the bare essentials of pieces of wood that you're going to try to rub together, or however you're going to try and start a fire, that's work. And so you can expand that definition into prepare so that you do not have to do the work to start a fire on the Sabbath. And that's really what, what God is, is about there. 
He says, I, I, I don't want you to do that work on the Sabbath, and therefore I want you to prepare so that you don't have to do that work on, on the Sabbath. And, and so what uh, should be done is you should start a fire on preparation day and keep that fire going through the Sabbath. That's if you're going to need a fire, of course. If you don't need a fire, you don't need it. Um, so, and, and that happens still in Israel. When we, we were there on, on the Sabbath, the hotels um, wouldn't start fires. Uh, what they would do is they would keep something in the kitchen. We thought it was probably a piece of string, a long piece of string, and they would light that string. And so a little burning ember would, would burn slowly through that string all through the night. And in the morning, the, the staff would come and use that ember to start all of the candles that they would use to keep the food warm. And, and they wouldn't, all the food would be prepared in advance, and they would have this little ember that would keep on glowing and, until the morning. And then they would take that ember and start a piece of paper on fire or something, and then start candles on fire from that, and, and the candles would keep the food warm. And so um, that was how they dealt with it. And that's not a bad way to deal with it. That's really what God wants uh, to have done, is that uh, you, you do all of your preparations in advance and, so that you can rest on the Sabbath. And so um, we understand from all of this is, is that this example about don't start a fire in your home isn't about the fire. It's about the work that it takes to make a fire. And that's what the Sabbath was about. It was about don't work on the Sabbath. And, and as I said, starting a fire was a lot of work. But for us in our lives now, lighting and heating don't take work. Um, they, uh, that's most countries and most places, as I said. There are certainly other, lots of other countries where people live exactly like that. Their heat for the day comes from the fireplace. Their cooking is done on the fireplace. Their light at night in the evenings is, is from the fireplace. And, and so that's, as city dwellers, we don't really have a lot of connection with that. But there are still lots of people and lots of Christians who live in that situation where they still live by a fire. And, and so we mustn't ever forget that as city dwellers, that, that the, whole, the whole world isn't just like us. But in our case, for sure, lighting and heating no longer take any work. Um, a flick of a switch is not work. And an automatic heating system that turns off and on is not work either. And, and so work has been removed from those tasks. They just doesn't require them anymore. And so the, the previous verse had just talked about this idea of whoever does any work on the Sabbath is to be put to death. And so you would really think that it would have been clear to someone like Israel and, and even to the Jews that, that the, the commandment not to start a fire on the Sabbath is not about the fire. It's about the work to start the fire. And, and nonetheless, there's a lot of people who get hung up on that and, and don't understand it. And so they, they, they bring that idea into our time in, in a way that isn't correct. And Israel was doing that too. And, and, um, but I think in his case, he was bringing that in because he just didn't want to understand it in the first place. His heart was in the right place on that. Now, there was another thing that, that came out uh, not long before we left that church. And that was a false Sabbath. And we've mentioned that a little bit before, uh, Pastor Joe and I. Um, they had brought out a completely new definition of the Sabbath. And uh, Israel and others in the denomination had produced this uh, new Sabbath, this new thinking for a new Sabbath. And uh, they introduced it in a lesson book. That's where we saw it first of all. And then later on, we saw it in Israel's book. Um, and in it, it had um, a new definition of a Sabbath. And this new Sabbath was a Sabbath uh, where you no longer needed to rest from work on the Sabbath. And, and um, I, would, I would go through all of his logic on this, but you can't really follow the logic. It isn't logical logic. Um, but basically the idea is that Jesus died and because of that, something like this happened and something like this happened. And, and it just doesn't make any sense when you try to follow it through. Nonetheless, um, they, they have this idea that because of this, we no longer need to rest uh, on the Sabbath. Uh, but we still can if we want, they say. Um, and, and we can do that, but we, we have to be careful not to work at resting too hard. And that's a really strange idea. Um, you, uh, working at, at keeping the Sabbath uh, is somehow becomes work. And, and, and it's uh, novel by any definition. Um, and, and so they introduced this idea that it was possible to work so hard at keeping the Sabbath that you would be breaking the Sabbath. And, um, and that's a complete misunderstanding of the Sabbath. Now, keeping the Sabbath takes no work. The only thing that keeping the Sabbath does is it moves work to other days. And so the, the, the work that you could do on the Sabbath, you should be doing on a different day. And, and uh, it doesn't mean that you have to do any more work. It doesn't mean that you have to do any less work. It, it just moves work around on your, your weekly schedule. 
Um, uh, Stan, yeah. Can I interject a little bit? Yeah. Um, this is uh, a concept that's been going on in uh, for quite a while, and I've heard mm -hmm. it from time to time from different people. Uh, when they try to justify what they want to do, even though it's in contra very contrary to scripture, they will find a way. Yes. Uh, I used to hear this man always say in, in one of the churches that I attended that it would be a sin for him to deny himself anything at all. <laughs> in fact, it would be a greater sin to deny himself something, even though it might be contrary in scripture. So that and so I couldn't follow the logic, but he was really sold on it, you know. And and I'm sure that these people that 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 same idea about the Sabbath it must have happened, done the same thing, you know. It's, yeah. It's just justifying their reasoning for some reason. Yeah, and that's completely true. And we've talked about that before too. Is the idea that that people when they want to do something, will find some reason, some justification, some rationale that they can hang on to and, and say that what they're doing is right, even though it contradicts what the Bible says. And, and people are amazing that way, but you see it all the time. And so um, in this false Sabbath that they were creating, um, they set the bar for working too hard really low. And, and so they defined working too hard as being the stress of an uncleaned house that would that the stress of that would be too much work now and so what they're doing here is what you often see with liberals is a false equivalence so they're saying that stress is equal to work but stress isn't equal to work stress in our lives is generally the result of um having too much work or it's the result of not getting work done because other things have conflicted or it's at work it might be that somebody isn't doing their work and you're having to do work for them or maybe somebody didn't do the work right and, and it has to be done again. And so now you're behind schedule. So stress is not work. Stress is often the result of work problems. But nonetheless, their definition for working too hard makes stress equal to work. And, um, and that's just not correct in a literal sense. Um, and it also doesn't fit with the Bible. So what they actually say from the lesson is, an example of working hard to rest is not cleaning up the messy house because it's the Sabbath and God says to rest. The problem with this is that the clutter and, me and messiness of the house brings stress, which is anti-rest in and of itself. So, so they're saying that, that stress is work and, and you shouldn't have any stress and therefore it's okay to work on the Sabbath because the stress of work is worse than work itself. Illogical. Um, so, in this false Sabbath, as, as they say above there, a messy house is stressful and stress is sort of like work and somehow that's greater work than cleaning the house and somehow too much work and it would be breaking the Sabbath not to clean the house. So the whole world gets turned upside down by their thinking. And all of this comes down again to not understanding what Preparation Day is about. And so Preparation Day shows that, that, that you're not understanding the Sabbath correctly at all. Um, it isn't possible to work too hard at keeping the Sabbath. There just isn't a meaning of that. How can you work hard at resting? You can't. Um, so, uh, but nonetheless, that's their reasoning. And, and what you should do instead is prepare in advance so that you don't have to work on the Sabbath. You don't have to worry on the Sabbath. Everything has been done. It's all prepared. It's all good. So referring back to their example, um, what you should do to avoid that problem that they're talking about in that false scenario they've created is do the housework on preparation day or before that so that everything is prepared so that you can rest on the Sabbath. So it's a really simple solution to this complicated problem that they think can only be addressed by working on the Sabbath. And, and that's because they don't understand the role of preparation day in preparing for the Sabbath. So we're going to go through a few verses about what the Bible says is work. And we're going to look at Jeremiah first. And these verses come from Jeremiah 17, 19 through 22. This is what the Lord said to me. Go and stand at the gate of the people through which the kings of Judah go in and out. Stand also at the other gates of Jerusalem. Say to them, hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah and all the people of Judah and everyone living in Jerusalem who come through these gates. This is what the Lord says. Be careful not to carry a load on the Sabbath day or bring it through the gates of Jerusalem. Do not bring a load out of your houses or do any work on the Sabbath, but keep the Sabbath day holy as I commanded your ancestors. So this load that he's talking about is people moving merchandise and food around, uh, probably for sale. 
So um, people who were shop owners and they had shop owners and shops at those times in Jerusalem um, were using that day to bring stuff into the city and out of their houses to restock the shelves of their stores and get everything ready so that they could open for business uh, on the, after the Sabbath. But that isn't what they were supposed to be doing. They were supposed to be doing no work at all. And, and so they had found uh, a, a reasoning that they could use. They could say, well, that I'm not really selling anything on the Sabbath. I'm, I'm just restocking my shelves. And they, they figured that that wouldn't be considered work. But God actually sent Jeremiah the prophet and other prophets to tell them, no, that's work. Um, you're not supposed to be doing that. And uh, so uh, we can see often again, as we were just talking about that idea that we often rationalize things that we want to do just because we want to do them. And we find some kind of reasoning to uh, allow us to do what we know shouldn't be done. So um, there's another verse from Nehemiah and Nehemiah talks about the Sabbath. He had uh, a couple places where he had problems with the Sabbath. Uh, remember his situation was that um, they had just, they were rebuilding Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem and, and starting to repopulate the city. And the people had been away from the Israel and the, the priests and all those sorts of things who were their sources of learning for 70 years, and they had lost some of that stuff. So uh, Nehemiah finds himself in the position of having to reteach the people the things that they should have known, but the things that they had lost before and during their uh, time uh, away out of, outside of Israel. So Nehemiah talks about that in verse uh, in 1029. All these now join their fe fellow Israelites, the nobles, and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God, given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord, our Lord. So what he's saying there is um, he put together a piece of paper that everybody was to sign and, and, and uh, bind themselves with a curse and an oath that they would follow the laws of God. And, and so he wanted everybody to know the laws and to actually commit, make that commitment of putting their mark on a piece of paper saying, I will do these things, I will keep these things. And, and so that was part of his method of, of teaching people and getting people to understand that this uh, was bound on them. Now, I just want to point out one thing that's a little off topic here, but it goes back again to last week. I think it was last week. Um, he says the degrees of the Lord, our Lord. Now, that is a situation where we talked about Yahweh being turned into the Lord um, uh, um, by some translators a long time ago. And so the word Yahweh has been re replaced by Adonai in the Bible. And so you, the result is that in places you get some really ridiculous statements of decrees of the Lord, our Lord. So you've got Lord, our Lord, because what's actually in the text is the decrees of Yahweh, our Adonai. And, and so, but when you turn Yahweh into the Lord, you wind up with the Lord, our Lord. Awkward stuff. And there's worse places than that. But that's off topic. I want you to see that though. Okay, so Nehemiah has gotten everyone to sign on to this agreement um, to keep the, the, the laws, not just the Sabbath laws, but all of them. And, and he goes on to list specific ones in that chapter. And, and uh, here's what he says about the Sabbath. He says, when the neighboring peoples bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on any holy day. Every seventh year, we will forgo, forgo working the land and will cancel all debts. debts. So that last sentence there uh, takes us back to last week as well, when we were talking about that seventh year Sabbath where the land was to sit fallow and not be plowed or worked or planted or sown or anything. And, um, and, and that's, that's the seven year Sabbath that he's talking about there. But the first part of that is the weekly Sabbath he's talking about. And he says, even though neighboring peoples might come and bring stuff uh, to sell on the Sabbath, we agree not to buy from them on the Sabbath or on any other holy day. And any other holy day, of course, is talking about the various feast days, which were also Sabbaths. So, um, so that was what Nehemiah was getting them to agree to and to understand were their obligations under the law. But despite that agreement, the people struggle with that, and, and Nehemiah has to go back to that again. And, and so later on in Nehemiah 13, 15 through 18, in those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads, and they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore, I warned them against selling food on that day. People from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? 
Didn't your ancestors do the same thing so that our God brought all this calamity on us, on the city? Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. And, and so, as I said before, Nehemiah was struggling to get people back in this mold that they had been in before of keeping the Sabbath weekly, and, and, um, and they had gotten out of that. And, and he's having trouble getting them to do that. And they're finding rationales. It looks like in this case, people from Tyre felt that they weren't bound by the Sabbath regulations. And so they were bringing in fish and selling it on the Sabbath. And, and so he says, no, that's not right. And the Bible is clear on that. It says, even the people from other lands who are in your land need to keep the Sabbath. So um, and continuing on with those verses. When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. From that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day. So things had become so bad that he needs to uh, use force to make sure that the people are keeping the Sabbath. And, and it also serves as a teaching lesson. They see the doors closed. They understand it's the Sabbath and they aren't supposed to be doing those things. But um, that's what Nehemiah faced in his time trying to restore things. And so there's another biblical example of preparation. And this one comes from the New Testament. And uh, I'll, I'll read this one. This is from Luke 23, 56, 24. Um, and they returned and prepared sweet spices and ointment. This is after Jesus has died. And on the Sabbath day, they rested according to that which has been commanded. But on Sunday morning, while it was dark, they came to the tomb and they brought the spices that they had prepared. And there were other women with them. So we see there the word prepared twice. And, and what's happening here is Jesus has died on the fourth day as the fifth day is about to begin. You remember that story, I'm sure. Uh, so the, if the next day is Passover, and, and that's the fifth day of the week. And it, Passover can fall on other days of the week, but this time it's the fifth day of the week. Um, disciples rest on that day because that's one of the Sabbath days. And on the sixth day, they, they go out and buy burial items that they're going to need, and they prepare those items. So they're getting ready to um, um, put them on Jesus' body. Um, and, and they do all that preparation on preparation day. And that's the, the sixth day, the weekly preparation day. And they rest on the seventh, seventh day. And then Jesus is resurrected on the first day about to begin. So they head out there with all these things that they have prepared to put on Jesus' body. And he's not there. So, uh, and that's the three days that the Bible says are going to be there. So you can see in that example that even after his death, they are continuing this pattern of preparing on the preparation days and doing their work on the other days. Now, this is something I bring up many times and have before. Sometimes things happen in life. Life is just that way. And, and um, perhaps your work has an emergency. And, and it's kind of amazing that this very week I have that situation in my own personal life. It hasn't happened in the past three years. But, but today, my employer has asked me to work this afternoon. And because it's a, an emergency for them, it's something uh, important to them, uh, it's a special situation, it won't be happening on a regular basis. I've agreed to do that. Um, and, and we should keep that option open. Um, sometimes things happen and it's necessary for you to do work on the Sabbath. And, and Jesus talked about that and, and said that that's fine, um, but you mustn't fall away from the Sabbath. And so we need to look at, at this as an act of love that, that we're showing to people um, in their emergency, helping them in their emergency. And, and Jesus also talks about the Sabbath is a good day to do good. And so this is a, a way to do good for people who are in an emergency situation. And, and so sometimes in life, despite your best plans, things just go wrong. And, and, and you, if you're a Sabbath keeper and you're preparing, sometimes you've prepared something and, and, um, and the plans just don't work out right. Something happens and it's not possible to, to do that. And you have to do something else instead. You have to work or you have to go out to a restaurant or, or whatever it is. So, um, and so uh, Jesus was talking to um, the religious elders in Luke 14, 5 about this. And, and he said to them, who of you whose son or ox should fall in a pit on the Sabbath day would not at once pull and lift him out? Well, obviously pulling an ox or, or even a child out of a, a ditch is going to take work. And, and he's saying, 
in those situations, those emergency situations where you're going to suffer a loss if you don't do something, if you don't do some work, then it's okay to do the work as long as you're going to come back to Sabbath keeping as, as is possible. And, and there's another verse that deals with this same topic coming from Mark 2, 25 through 27. Yeshua said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in great need and was hungry, he and his companions? As he entered the house of God, when Abiathar was chief priest, and he ate the bread of the altar of the Lord Yahweh, which was not legal to eat except for the priests, he gave also to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was created for the sake of man and not man for the sake of the Sabbath. So what happened there, um, and I think probably all of you know this, but I'll, I'll say it again anyway, is that uh, David and, and the people traveling with him were escaping from Jerusalem and um, they, they had no food. They'd run out of food and uh, actually they were escaping from Saul. I think I've got that wrong. This is uh, when David and his companions were escaping from Saul. And, and so they uh, had run out of food. They were hungry. They went to Abiathar, the chief priest. And normally it wasn't allowed for anyone except for priests to eat this daily bread that was created. Um, the, the commandments instructed that there was daily bread that was to be prepared every day at the temple. And uh, that was to be done and, and to be only eaten by the chief priests. And, uh, but in this case, um, Abiathar and David both understood that this was an emergency situation. They, they were hungry. They had no food. And, and so Abiathar allowed them to eat the, the bread, which normally they wouldn't be allowed to eat. And so in these two examples and others in there that Jesus talks about, the, um, the Sabbath is made for the benefit of man, uh, not man for the Sabbath. And, and so when situations arise and life is full of those situations, sometimes it's necessary to work on the Sabbath. So we need to keep that in mind that, that uh, we ourselves and we also allow that same thing to other people when there are situations, special situations where your best laid plans have fallen apart. You, you need to exercise that uh, option. Now, in dealing with other Christians, um, believers are not all at the same level. We need to really understand that. We, we've talked about that before, is that the Catholic Christians are still Christians, but they're kind of small, weak Christians because they're not getting really good teachings. Protestants are a little better that way, and, and other churches are worse that way. We won't go into all of that in this lesson. But um, believers are not at the same level for various reasons. And, and some of them think the Sabbath was canceled. Uh, in all of the Protestants, you'll, you'll find that uh, universally, is that they believe that the Sabbath was canceled. And, and some think they're keeping the Sabbath when they really aren't keeping the Sabbath. They kind of created their own Sabbath, and, and they like their own Sabbath, and they, they do that. And they, they think that they're doing the right thing, but they aren't. Um, and everyone is stronger in some areas and weaker in other areas. And so all of these things are things that we need to employ um, in dealing with other people. And, and the reason that we're different is that the Holy Spirit is taking everyone on different paths to perfection. And, and we won't reach that perfection, perfection in this life, but nonetheless, we're on different paths. And so we're at different places. And, and the only thing that we can do is accept that we're going to be different because of that and show love, mercy, and wisdom in dealing with everyone. And, and that's just biblical teaching uh, straight from the Bible. And, and also keep something in mind. Remember that chewing food takes work, and, and we sometimes think of work as being in bigger ways, but, but that's one of those things. And, and it helps to understand that Yom Kippur, the holiest Sabbath day of all of the Sabbath days, was a day when people weren't allowed to eat at all. It was a fast day, and that was the only Sabbath day that was a fast day. And, and uh, so on that day, you didn't, it was such a holy day that you didn't even chew food on that day. You didn't do that work. So... And, and also another thing is other fa feast days um, allowed some work. Um, they allowed light work um, and it's on some, but some of them were just like the weekly Sabbath where you weren't supposed to do any, any work. And as I said, Yom Kippur required, was a day when you didn't even chew food. So um, keep that in mind is that the Sabbath isn't a hard regulation that's meant to make you suffer. Um, it is um, a day that you should keep and you should enjoy, um, you should prepare for, which is kind of our topic here. And um, and allow those same um, leniencies that you would give yourself uh, to other people who are at different places in, in their lives. So summarizing all of this, Preparation Day is not just a day of the week. It's how we live our whole lives, and we live our whole lives for a future Sabbath, a future rest. And, and so everything in our lives is supposed to be preparing us for that future rest. 
Um, but in our weekly lives, we also have preparation day, and it is how we live um, for a future or for a one day future Sabbath rest uh, for the coming weekly Sabbath. And, and so that preparation day is a day when we should be getting ready so that we can rest, preparing to, to rest. And preparation day also helps us understand the Sabbath. And we saw that with the false teachings that were in NHU, is that if they had understood the role of preparation day, they wouldn't have come to such bad ideas, but they did. And so I'll summarize all of this, or conclude all of this, I guess, with a verse from Luke 12, 46 through uh, 47. And that is, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he does not expect, and in an hour when he does not know. The servant who knew the will of his master and did not prepare for him, according to his will, he shall be beaten many times. And so God expects us to live to this pattern that he's set up, uh, preparing as we should, resting when we should. Any 